I'm going to try this week and next week to weave together a number of things that you might have um, learned in the past month, which is just the, the parts of this series before, but also to integrate what Pastor Derek taught uh, on Good Friday, the, the message before uh, Easter Sunday. Uh, he taught, a, I don't know if you remember, the serpent crushing king. Remember that from Matthew? So I'm going to explain that a little bit uh, or integrate that into what um, into this topic, as well as um, just understanding why that's so important. There's, there's some areas within that triumphal entry passage that um, I want to give you a little bit more insight as to why that's so important. Um, so with that, um, and also I'm going to tie in a little bit of what Pastor Cliff taught on Day of the Lord last week, and I'm going to add a few things to that as well. So hopefully you enjoy today's lesson. Okay, so um, a little bit cleaner than what's on the whiteboard. Today uh, we'll be at part eight, coming of the Messiah. There are requirements for this Messiah. It's not like so, because Pastor Derek said, well, it wasn't, um, well, Adam failed, right? And it wasn't Moses, it wasn't Abraham and Josiah and a number of others. They all failed, right? And so here, I want to state from Scripture, what are the requirements of the coming of the Messiah? Okay? And then with that, the requirements, next week we'll cover how did Jesus fulfill all those requirements? Okay. And then um, we're going to have two-part series on the Jewish marriage. <clears throat> A lot of people say Jewish wedding, but it's more of Jewish marriage, which the first stage is um, called the Kaddishan, and then there's a second stage called the Hoopah. The hoopa, where the sea is silent. So um, there's two stages to this, and this example of how they did it in the ancient days, you will, I think, have a fascinating time of correlating what is the rapture. Okay, so um, I'm really looking forward to explaining that um, <clears throat> during those lessons. Just a quick recap. This is the email I sent to you probably about a week and a half ago or two where just to wrap it up, the coming of the Messiah is in two phases, the rapture and the second coming. And these are just very stark differences to compare the two. Christ comes from heaven to be in the air to meet with believers, whereas in the second coming, he descends all the way down to earth. Most people think it's uh, the Mount of Olives, as described in Zechariah. There's some debate about whether it's in, um, in another area in Edom called Basra. So there's some passages in um, Isaiah. So, but either way, Christ lands on the earth in the second coming. Another interesting fact is, in the rapture, only his own will see him. But in the second coming, many will see him. When he lands on the Mount of Olives, <clears throat> there's a great earthquake, the land splits, things move. So there's a, there's a big difference. Um, and another one is Christ comes as a deliverer, as a bridegroom in the rapture. But the second coming, nowhere near like that. He comes as a warrior, as a king of kings and lord of lords, to, to do battle, to render judgment. All right. So there's a whole bunch of others. It's in the it's uh, in your um, email, this table, and then um, one thing that's key takeaways from Pastor Cliff's lesson last week: the day of the Lord is a very technical phrase when it's used. We don't want to confuse it with some other parts of Scripture that says the day or on that day that really needs to be qualified to really be in the same category as Day of the Lord. So, uh, and this is used consistently in the four times that the apostles uh, Peter and Paul um, have in the New Testament. The main theme out of Day of the Lord is, is God's judgment of sin. 
that's the main theme is nowhere that's why it's so different than the rapture involves judgment not blessing and with that category as you read some scripture we can't say for example the millennium is day of the lord so that in that sense that chart is wrong that one little part in my mind okay because in the millennium there'll be blessing there, there's judgment toward the beginning and definitely toward the end but the whole thousand years is there is some blessing there people live uh, for centuries as an example the lion will lie with the lamb and so forth um, so this is uh, what Pastor Cliff taught and I, I did read through um, the 24 page document he sent me from uh, Dr. Mayhew which explains a lot of that and he's, he's um, a, um, an esteemed professor of probably 40 to 50 years on this topic um, so here uh, this is just a summary but um, there's day the Lord refers to, to the at second coming and the end of the millennium and then these precursors that um, he mentioned these things have to happen before the day of the Lord and part of the confusion I think within let's say the great apostasy or the rebellion of the earth's inhabitants um, the man of sin that does the abomination of desolation those kind of things one key aspect to really try to understand that is to understand the timing of the Thessalonian letters first and second Thessalonians there's a lot of um, foundational uh, thesis that some of these other views use for, for their foundation so the timing of first Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5 the timing of second Thessalonians especially chapter 2 those things are um, we need to really understand the language structure of, of, of Greek and to understand how and where it ties in so um, I think that's a whole Bible study in itself the Thessalonian letters so that's why I'm, I'm going to kind of avoid that I was going to use that to try to explain it but it would just take so much background information to, to really explain those two letters even though they're very short <laughs> alright so, so what do we have here is this is a kind of a simplified timeline of, of this chart I just whited out a bunch of stuff to try to kind of get it to to uh, the main points that I want to emphasize so within this uh, simplified chart we have um, Jesus first coming let's see does this work no it disappears when it gets onto the screen so uh, Jesus first coming died for our sins uh, and then resurrection that you are here so we're at the church age then comes the rapture the seal judgments trumpet judgments bold judgments at the bottom and then the Jesus second coming to reign end of the millennium and then then that be I mean I'm sorry end of the tribulation and then begins the millennium and then the various um, judgments uh, the great white throne judgment for example and then um, up at top the second uh, line below the day of the Lord is the marriage of the lamb to the bride and this is where this is really interesting how the Jewish marriage t gives us a timing of that when that occurs okay and the way it's written on this chart it starts at the beginning of the seven year tribulation this chart is saying the church is going to be married to Christ and they will be spared of the time of God's wrath so they will be in the marriage so called ceremony and um, the marriage supper of the lamb and during that whole period which in the Jewish tradition is seven years matches the seven years of tribulation so during the tribulation the church is going to be celebrating with Jesus and will be spared of the wrath to come 
Okay, so that's just one connection. I just wanted to point that out. So this is kind of a simplified um, chart. And then we cover these things. In the last days is where we are, I think. And then the beginning of birth pangs is right before the rapture. The birth pangs is um, the tribulation, the seven year tribulation period. And then at the end of that, through all that birth pains comes the birth of the messianic age. So something beautiful happens through the birth. Okay, so that's how it's connected. All right, so uh, with that, the day of the Lord happens at the second coming, and another one happens at the white throne judgment. Okay. One thing I read interesting, um, I was digging through my notes of many years ago, and I found this. I want to share this with you. This day of the Lord, this idea of day of the Lord, think of it this way, that it is God's time, it is not man's time. So in the phrase, the day of the Lord, it is of the Lord, it is His and it is his day, so he's the one that defines what's going to happen, and it's going to be judgment. He's the one that not only has his day, he's the one that created day. That's, that, that's how elevated we should look f at that phrase. Don't look at it just from a human perspective, what's going to happen. What is it from God's perspective? He's total creator, in control, the judge, sovereign, everything. This is his day. Okay. So the day of the Lord, the day of the wrath of Yahweh, it designates God's decisive intervention in history for judgment. So you look at it that way, where it's judgment, not blessing. These are historic days of the Lord, historic divine innova uh, invasions and judgments. The prophets spoke of them. Okay. And those are some of the previews of what's going to happen that's already um, occurred. And some are yet to come, which is the, um, the end times. So I want to give you, I want to go through one example in the book of Joel. So turn to the book of Joel, chapter 1, verse 15. Somebody read chapter 1, verse 15. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so this day, of this um, one fifteen. so the prophecy in the book of Joel, so 115 is talking about a near view fulfillment. So this verse is talking about is fulfilled when the Babylonians take over. So this is a very terrible day. And in the Jews' mind, this captivity kind of um, completes the so-called annihilation of Israel. The, the northern kingdom um, uh, succumbed to the Assyrians and then now the southern kingdom to the Babylonians and we learn from the earlier chapters of Daniel that Nebuchadnezzar went to Jerusalem three times to level it the first time take Daniel and his friends second time to ransack um, Solomon's temple and the third time just like whatever's left so this Babylonian captivity is a fulfillment of this passage in Joel, where um, it truly is a um, come as destruction for the Almighty. Okay. Then we get um, other passages in Joel, chapter 2, verse 1, 11, and 31. And in that one, if... Verse two, chapter 2 verse 1 says blow the trumpet in Zion and a sound an alarm in my holy mountain let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming for it is at hand and as you read the rest of chapter 2 
it is so much more in terms of the of the judgment and the cosmic disturbances that are in it. So verse two says, the "Day of darkness, gloominess," um, and just as it just keep on reading, it just it's talking about this is something very major. So here in this passage. Within the, the book of Joel, this is a far view fulfillment. So here's the prophet Joel writing about day of the Lord. Um, and is saying that it, this will be fulfilled in the second coming, not now. Okay. I'm kind of breezing, I'm kind of going through this really quickly, but this is going to kind of give you some highlight and you can study more on your own. And then Joel 3.14 as well. Joel 3.14, um, this is when God judges the nations. It says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Um, so here, this is a referencing uh, of the day of the Lord pointing to the second coming of Christ. And earlier in this chapter, it says, all the nations will assemble there. So this is an allusion to the second coming when you have the battle of um, um, Armageddon. Let's see one more. Yeah, so Joel 3, 14 and in verse 15 says, The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness. So these things that happen are so um, unique and at a, such a grand scale, it's really pointing to the end times. So this is why we say that this is about the end times. All right. Okay. My next chart. Get my notes here together. I don't know if you guys ever tried PowerPoint with the notes feature. The only thing I don't like is when I print that out, it's one page per slide. And there's many slides that I don't need notes for. So it's like, do I want to print out 25, 30 pages? So I struggle with what to do with that. All right. So day of the Lord, I want to give you one more day of the Lord <laughs> that is in addition to the two that has already been mentioned. So here again, um, the simplified um, chart. I, fo I zoom in now on from the rapture to the end. So um, Jesus comes to reign as day of the Lord in the second coming. And then at the millennium, as we learned before, um, there will be judgment for all. But I believe there's another day of the Lord within this uh, chart. And I want to look at the seven seals. Okay. So the seven seals, um, if you go to Revelation chapter 6, it's, I'm going to read verses 1 to 2, Revelation 6. It says, Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seals, one of the seven seals, I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and his rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. So, so this seven seals is here, and it occurs in the tribulation. And the first seal is this white horse. And this rider is conquering, no arrows, so somehow he's a very good no uh, negotiator and, and talker. And he's the one that's doing things. So this does not qualify to me as something from God yet. He, God allows it, but this is the white horse. This is the beginning of the coming of the Antichrist. Okay, And he's the one because he is able to ride in and conquer, meaning that he's able to negotiate with many people, including Israel, of peace and have a peace treaty. So this is how it correlates with the peace treaty for the first half of the tribulation. Yeah. <clears throat> so next, what's happening on the next one? Verses 3 to 4 says, When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and out came another horse bright red. His rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so the people should slay one another. 
and he was given a great sword. So here God permits this, but this is where there's a lot of bloodshed. And this is caused by this red horse. Next is the third seal. Verse 5, it says, Come, and I look, and behold, a black horse, and his rider had a, a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four cre living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. That's a very complex passage, but basically it's, uh, it, uh, food is scarce and is expensive. Okay. So this is, again, this, these are things that are happening on the earth and it's caused by these riders who's under the devil's control. The last one, I mean, the last one within this group, the four horsemen, is the fourth horse. It says, verse, verse uh, 7, <coughs> When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. So a quarter of the earth's population will be killed. And this is caused by the fourth rider. So here again, it's, I don't think it's the um, something that God has divinely put on, so I don't think it's the day of the Lord. But then as we get a little bit further down the line on the seals, the, the fifth one talks about the persecution of the Jews. Um, and then to me, the sixth and seventh seal is where God steps in, where the sixth one says it's a d divine cosmic upheaval. This is something that only God can do. The sixth seal. And then the seventh seal opens and that becomes seven trumpets. Right? So this is where I think the, the day of the Lord, another event where God's wrath and judgment is poured upon um, the earth, starts in the sixth seal and goes forward. And this is a very kind of... Um, debatable topic because some people say well that's when so-called God's wrath comes so this is where they get the pre-wrath view okay so there's just a lot of there's just a lot of things going on I just want to present this to you as as my thoughts on it and um, big picture it may not seem to be that um, big of a deal so to speak but um, this is where we have to really divide the word very well and this is where it's very difficult okay. Peter, yes question um, yeah yeah revelation chapter 5 talks about how christ would take seven scroll he's worthy to take seven scroll and he took it right that's in revelation 5 yeah the, right? the seven seals of the scroll that's right yeah um, mm -hmm. and, and, and no one could take it but then they all cried up there yeah. Then he came and took it. Yeah. So would that constitute um, um, God is the one that is sovereign? He's, he's taking that part of it, although he's not actively sitting, you know, doing the work. He's not the man, and, mm -hmm. uh, but he is basically taking that scroll. So what does that mean to take the scroll? Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I am in charge of what's going to happen, or. Um, you know, even though from human perspective we we can see all these things happening, but maybe is it can we say that it's from God's perspective that I'm taking charge of what's about to happen? Maybe mm -hmm. that's where the conflict of the, the, yeah. Yeah, this 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 conflict or or this tension um, is similar to Job chapters one and two, okay. where some people say, Well, did God punish Job or did God permit Satan to oh, Job. Oh. yeah to to do that so I'm sorry yeah then Job so here taking that scroll in Revelation 5 is extremely important because why was no one able to be worthy to take it is because they didn't feel they didn't fulfill the requirement of that and we'll get to that next week a bit but they didn't only Jesus could 
to take the so-called the scroll, which is a symbol of the title deed of the earth. Okay, so he's the one that can, he's the one that's qualified that can take the scroll. And then if you read the language in Revelation, it says that they are permitted, they are permitted versus. So even though the, these four horsemen did the dirty deed, God allowed it, right. but God didn't cause it. Right. Yeah, so that that's the tension. Right. Yeah. So wouldn't that mean that Christ is the one that is he's, he's now intervening in man's affair on earth, starting with the rapture? Well, um, yeah, it, it is because God is always in control and He's sovereign, so everything happens is permitted and He knows it before it happens. Um, but there's man's responsibility, and this is part of the um, so-called the the outcome of the sin and some of the things that just occurs. And and so we'll learn next week that, like for example, Adam's sin. In our mind, we say Adam's sin caused God to have another plan because he couldn't fulfill it. But in God's view, God has always had this plan, and, and his plan is revealed more after Adam's sin. He had to provide a way out, which is the seed. So there's just all these, like, you can kind of say it from the man's perspective, from God's perspective on that. Okay. All right, good question. So this is where, if I try to, to apply um, the definition of the day of the Lord as being divine judgment coming from God, then seal 6 and 7 is, um, in my mind, uh, qualifies for that. Okay. All right. Okay, next. So as we take a step back, there, there's just so much going on within all this. I want to take a step back and, and how to view the comings of Christ. So here, we'll start with creation. So we have creation all, all the way to e eternity, future, and these judgments, rapture, second coming, and so forth. So the Bible starts at creation, Genesis, goes all the way to um, the new heavens and new earth in Revelation. And as you read the Bible, it unfolds the coming of Christ. You, you can see Christ in, involved in, um, or being described in parts of basically every book in the Bible. So, I'm trying to take a step back, what is God saying in the Bible through all this? Um, I was asked when I was a young believer, probably over 20 years ago, 30 years ago, say, and this, this young youth pastor asked me, you know, so Peter, what do you think the Bible is all about? And then one day he would say, you know, it's about missions. Uh, it's about gospel. So, what do you think the Bible is all about? <laughs> you know, there's so many, right? What do you think? <laughs> so, what is God saying? What is the Bible all about? So, a lot of times we could think about it from a human perspective that it's about the gospel. We should evangelize, right? It's about mission that everybody, um, we can reach all the people groups, you know, other examples like that. And there's so many, I typed it in on Google search and there's so many. <laughs> and and I don't want to bore you with, there's so, so many other details and, and, and uh, simple descriptions. Um, I want to give you this one, you can kind of think about this one. The Bible contains details about God's plan and purposes. God created everything, including man, who are made in God's image, and made for the express purpose of having fellowship with God. Okay. So, 
I I ran across this one and I thought this one was pretty good because it it helps me to understand well the gospel is in there missions is in there God wants it wants man to have fellowship with him in a way he didn't have to create man right yes So, yeah, and as we think about all for God's glory, and there's many passages that talk about that as well, right? So how I wanted to fold this in is I put God's plan and purpose with what uh, I wrote it again in the first bullet. And as we think about Genesis, what did God say or um or what did he want? What was his desire in the first couple chapters of Genesis? So one one says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So part of some people call this the uh, Eden or Edenic covenant. The, these verses in uh, chapter one, verses twenty six to roughly thirty, and then chapter two. Verses 15 to 17 is the covenant in Edom or Edenic covenant. So what is God doing in the, in the end of the first chapter? He's saying, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish, the birds, livestock, so forth, over all the earth and over every creeping thing on the earth. So notice that not only are we, we have the privilege of being made in God's image, what is the command? Have dominion. Okay. So that's God's plan, is for mankind to have dominion. So that's why he, I think that's one reason why God's so upset when, uh, when in Egypt they make these gods that are lower than man. <laughs> make all these animals and birds and whatever else. Um, and then I, another um, key verse is 28 128 says God bless them said to them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it have dominion over every living thing that moves on the earth so subduing the earth is God's giving man all the earth the land to cultivate it to subdue it to take care of it you don't subdue something if you don't take care of it okay so and then verses in chapter 2 it gives you a little bit more detail of what happened in chapter 1 the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it that's when they keep the land okay. commanded the man you may surely eat of every of every tree um, I overtyped um yeah, and then, but uh, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Right? So this is God's plan and purpose for man as we see in Genesis 1 and 2. So, so what are Adam's duties in, this, in these commands? There's four. So as God's image bearer, Adam is to have dominion. And that's why... Um, Derek used the word king, ruler, king, to have dominion over every living thing. He's to work the earth and keep it, be fruitful, multiply, shall not eat of the knowledge of good and evil. So there's four commands to rule, to care for the earth or the land, to be fruitful, multiply, and to obey. Those are, those are the four. This is what Adam should do, right? So, um, as Pastor Derek mentioned, what should Adam have done 
when the serpent tried to deceive Eve, really, and Adam is there. He should have exercised his kingship and crushed the serpent when confronted. This is where Pastor Derek said he failed. He did not crush it when it was asked. He should know God's word and notice that he twisted God's command. So this led to Adam and Eve eating the, from the forbidden tree. So this sin of disobedience disqualified Adam and his descendants from being ruler because he disobeyed. Okay? And it resulted in curses and death. So of the four commands, one of them was to obey, and he didn't obey. Okay. So this is, um, Pastor Derek mentioned about how all these other so-called potential candidates are some of them, well, he sinned and he sinned, so had to be perfect obedience. So, so Pastor Derek um, said, well, who may be this king? Uh, Adam disobeyed, and then Noah was a preacher of righteousness, but he sinned. This is in Genesis 9. Abraham it was counted to him as righteousness in Genesis 15, but he sinned many times, as we know. Moses, he spoke directly to God. He spoke to God directly, uh, led his Israelites out of Egypt and in the wilderness, but he sinned, struck the rock in Numbers chapter 20, verse 11. David, man after God's heart, but he sinned, obviously with Bathsheba. And Solomon, full of wisdom, but yet also sinned. Okay. So Jesus qualifies because he's sinless, perfect obedience to God the Father. John 14.31 says, I do as the Father has commanded me. Okay. So this is where we get the part of, well, he qualifies as as the um, the king or from the seed and I'm going to skip through a lot of things but basically as we see Jesus qualifies there's a moment in time when he actually declares himself as king when he was on the earth so there's a, there's a setup here where this phrase the hour has not yet come have you heard that? Right, so um, you see in John two four when he performs the very first miracle at Cana um, at the marriage, and and um, and Jesus said to to her, um, Mary said, uh, "My hour has not yet come." John two four. John 4, verses 21 and 23 says, The hour is coming and is now here. So it's kind of approaching. John 5, 25 says that as well. And then people start to notice of the things he's doing. So they think that he might be the king. So John 6, verse 15 says, Jesus perceiving then that they're about to come and take him by force to make him king. So Jesus withdrew again to the, to the mountain by himself. So he said, no, the hour has not come yet. It's not time. Jesus in, in chapter 7 of John says, my time has not yet come, for my time has not fully come. And a couple more. Um, they seek to arrest him, but no one said, my hour has not come. Not yet. So, I want to tell you a, a funny story. We were in um, Vietnam and we had this guy that gave, gave us a story and he was saying, uh, wonderful guide and he presented history of Vietnam and all that. And he said, oh, what else do you do? And he goes, I take some groups to the mountains of Vietnam that borders on Laos and so forth. So, and he said, he, one time he took to this group to kind of a, a very um, distant, uh, far away place, and because he does a lot of hiking trips for them. And then the next day, he had to have a super early flight. 
so the so-called um, not even hotel but the the person that was in charge of where he was staying said he goes oh can you wake me up like you know two or three in the morning here's the mountains it's dark it's gloomy and apparently that guy didn't speak that well english so he gets this wake-up call and he wakes up and it's like is he he's kind of lost as to where it is because it's so early in the morning so the the hotel person said over the phone in a kind of a broken English goes your time has come <laughs> he's like oh <laughs> it's like and he was like where am I <laughs> oh my gosh so that's what he gets for being in that uh, place right? so his time has come well in this case in in Jesus the hour has come, right? So in the, in the triumphal entry in John 12, people are saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And indeed, Jesus says in John 12, 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So here it is that of all the times that... Um, that uh, Jesus de said, "Not yet, not yet," and uh, don't tell anybody. Well, this is this is the time, <laughs> and I want to point this out because um, this is this triumphal entry is so important. It's in all four gospels, right? So previously, Jesus tells his disciples to be quiet about him. A couple of passages in the book of Matthew. So this one occasion is so unique because he declares himself as king in fact he sets up the arrangements he's the one that tells them to get to go to this place get a donkey and a colt in fulfilling of a prophecy in Zechariah 9 9 Jesus is the one that's saying do all this because this is the hour all right and if and uh, and these are the passages that are in the um, Gospels on the triumphal entry and I want to highlight a few things um, I'm going to give you a handout so this is in all four Gospels what I did was I um, so-called harmonized them in one reading so it's color-coded where the four Gospels have um, part portions of this um, triumphal entry and what's in black is Matthew 21 as the so-called baseline where it's edited from there. So you can pass that. Thank you. If you haven't done it before, it's kind of cool to harmonize the Gospels for any particular story because some of them, um, you get additional information. So as, as you get that, um, to kind of give you a reference, um, right below the title of the paper in black is Matthew chapter 21. And whatever the other Gospels had a little bit different, I superseded Matthew. So, th so I didn't add all the words and, and left words of all four in, in this paper. And then in green is Mark, in red is Luke, and in blue is John. And let's see. So this is Matthew 21, 1 to 11. So um, if, you, if you look at it in the first paragraph, um, Luke provides a little bit more detail. It says that there's a cold tide on which no one yet has ever sat untied and bring it here. So that's a little additional thing that um, makes it not only does it show Jesus being omniscient in that way, but that this is a stipulation. This is no one else has ride on this colt before. And then, um, yeah, in green, 
Mark adds a, a bit of a conversation um, about people asking, uh, you know, and Jesus, they said that um, Jesus gave permission. Um, let's see. In the middle paragraph, I want to highlight um, in green leafy branches. This is only in Mark. And this is just to highlight that they don't just put branches and sticks there because the donkey and colt might trip and Jesus is on it, right? So these leafy branches means that it's, it's a young uh, leaf, leafy thing, so it's soft and it's easy to walk on. Okay, this is something that Mark added. Uh, okay. So, and then in in the lower middle in blue, that whole paragraph, John adds the comment: "These things his disciples did not understand at the first, <laughs> so they didn't get it in the beginning." So this is again adding a bit more detail as to this is the frame of mind that these disciples uh, had. Uh, so. And then in red, which we'll get to later, is a big chunk in Luke that's not in any of the Gospels. And this is the one I'm going to concentrate on in a bit. But this, this is where um, what Luke added is very important. Okay. So, um, just want to just highlight that for you. And everybody get a handout? I got a few more here. You can come up at the end. So, um, so here Luke adds these uh, these verses. So thirty seven and and thirty eight, he he adds that when Jesus is approaching the Mount of Olives, and then he um, he hears. That here's the crowd shouting, Blessed is the King, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, this is going to be key in a moment, but this is different than what the other three Gospels recorded. The other three Gospels said something also similar, but here's an additional thing that the crowd said. And because they said that, verse 39, the Pharisees gives you a clue what Jesus, what is really meant by it because the Pharisees said to Jesus to him teacher rebuke your disciples we don't want your disciples to say this we'll, we'll see why in a moment and Jesus replied even if these people in the crowd stop speaking the stones will cry out like wow whatever they're shouting must be really important right it's like why why is that and then verse 41 is something that is very, uh, very emotionally um, charged for Jesus. This is something that is very, um, it's so deep because the word wept is a very, is the strongest word for grief in Greek. So, he approaches Jerusalem, he's riding to the Mount of Olives, he sees the city, and he weeps bitterly. And he's saying, if you had only known this day, you did not know this day, if you had only known the conditions for peace, you could have had peace, but you didn't know. You couldn't recognize it. Right? And then verse 43 and 44 talks about the destruction of Jerusalem, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation that when I visited, you did not recognize it. Okay? So this set, this few verses really helps us to understand this whole triumphal entry much more. I don't want to get into it too much because uh, Pastor Cliff is going through Luke, right? So he eventually will get here. I don't know when. <laughs> so, but I just want to just kind of um, just let you know, this is uh, important. So what's happening here? Um, the crowd is spreading their cloaks on the road. They're putting leafy branches on the road. They're saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So what are they doing? So what's happening is this blessed be 
he who comes in the name of the Lord, they are actually reciting Psalms 113 to 118. So you can do, read this up later, but basically in many of these uh, Passovers and other major events, they, they recite these six Psalms as they're marching up to Jerusalem. And why is that? Is because this is to give honor to God for God delivering them from Egypt. Okay, so that's in Psalm 114. So the focus is on the Exodus as the reason that these Psalms are sometimes recited as they go up during Passover. So what is the crowd's desire? And I want to focus on the one phrase that the crowd says. So in Psalm 118, verse 26, this is what they're reciting as they're marching up. Blessed is he who is in the name of the Lord. Psalm 118, verse 26. So Matthew 21, 5 is the same thing. Mark, 19, Mark 11, 9. Um, John adds a little bit more. That some of the crowd also recite the king of Israel. So that's part of the illusion is that they want him to be king. So they recite that. And then Luke 19.39, which the Pharisees later got upset about, is blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. So now they're putting the king instead of in the word he. Right. So this slightly changed the word. This revealed that they wanted a king. Singing these psalms as you go walking up the, in the Passover is not out of the ordinary. But what is out of the ordinary is the donkey, the coats, the palm branches, the, sp the specific crowds. All this, laying it before Jesus walking, is a sign of royalty. It's a sign that they recognize him as king, they want him as king, and they're giving him the so-called red carpet treatment. So that's why they're laying all this out. And then the Pharisees' reaction is, um, when they hear this, they go, this has prophetic implications. They want, they're saying, well, they recognize Hosanna in the highest, is saved now in the highest, that Jesus had to come to deliver them spiritually. So the Pharisees are saying, Jesus, rebuke your disciples because they want them to stop saying these accolades. They think it's blasphemy. Because they're associating now Jesus as king that will save, that will be the king. Okay. So, and they, they can't quiet this huge crowd. The only one that can quiet the crowd is the one that all the crowd is looking to, which is Jesus. <laughs> so that's why they say, hey, Jesus, can you tell them to be quiet? <laughs> all right. So, um, so Jesus wanted the Jews to know so as we read earlier, it says that Jesus gave a very interesting reply. He says that if these people should keep silent, the stones will cry out. And he reveals why. Like I said, he wept. It's possibly the strongest word for grief in the Greek language. If he had known the day for peace. And then he says, well, the consequence of you not knowing is the temple is going to be destroyed. You did not know the time of you being visited by Jesus. So what happened in 70 AD? Titus Vesperian had these four Roman legions lay siege on Jerusalem. And in what's to follow, 143 days, 600,000 Jews were killed. And then people estimate over one and a half million men, women, children died from the siege, the famine, and all the disease that um, followed. So Jesus ascribed the destruction of Jerusalem to the fact that the Jews did not know that Jesus was presented as king that day. So Jesus held the Jews accountable for not knowing Daniel chapter 9. This, now I'm tying into Daniel finally. Right? So what does Daniel chapter 9, I'm going to try to race through this and then I'll probably mention it again next week. Too. So 
This is Daniel 9.25, and I put the ESV, NASB, and New King James Version on it. And, and if you note, it says, I'll read the ESV, Know therefore understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of the anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks, then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. So other translations say instead of the word is the decree or the command. So there is a decree that issued out that says, go rebuild Jerusalem. So that's the starting point of this verse. And what is the end point? Is when um, the anointed one, the prince, will come. Okay. So I put the New King James in here because that's one of the very few translations that has the word wall on the bottom, bottom line. Why is that important? Because there's, I think there was four decrees to say rebuild Jerusalem. So which one of the four is this passage referring to? It's the one that says rebuild the wall as part of it. If you look up in your Bibles in Nehemiah chapter 2, so Nehemiah chapter 2 talks about him going with the decree to rebuild the wall. Right? So I, I went and looked at Bible Hub, looked up the interlinear, and indeed it says, and the wall. So if you want to go through and look up the word and all that, but it's just another kind of affirmation. But it's, it's interesting that other translations use the moat or street or something, all right? So what's the day of that Messiah's visitation? The decree to restore Jerusalem was the decree of Artaxerxes, March 14, 445 B.C., okay? This is in Nehemiah chapter 2. And that's the starting point. What's the end point is the Messiah, the King, is coming. So we read from Daniel, they ought to know, but well, when was Daniel written? It was in the Septuagint. So Daniel chapter 9 was in the Septuagint, was written 300 years before the triumphal entry. So this is a prophecy. This is a prediction, right? So the triumphal entry is April 6, 32 AD. So what did Daniel 9.25 say? Seven weeks and 62 weeks, which is 69 weeks. And a week is a week of years, and a week of seven years. I'll go into that when we get into chapter 9. So 69 weeks times seven times in the Jewish calendar, how many days in the year? 360. So, the angel Gabriel told Daniel in chapter 9, verse 25, that it's going to take 173,880 days from the decree by Artaxerxes to restore Jerusalem to when the Messiah will come. Okay? Guess what? There's a guy, Sir Robert Anderson, back, I think, about 80 to 100 years ago, that did this calculation. And it's not an easy calculation. He had to go through the various calendars. He had to go through how many leap years were there. Then there was the year zero doesn't count. And then there was another correction of the calendar at another time. So he wrote, I think it's like 80 to 100 pages, this book. So I have a copy and PDF of it, if you, want to, if you want to check the math. Okay, but this is amazing that the angel Gabriel prophesied to the day that this happened. Okay. So, so I want to bring it in to Daniel. These four verses are so loaded, chapter 9, verse 24 to 27, that this should give us um, motivation to really study God's word because every word is true. And, and here he's holding the Jews accountable for not knowing this. And there's other signs as well. You know, he's going to come from a certain city, you know, and, and all the other things and other prophets. So there's other things. Um, but so anyway, uh, I'm looking forward to studying this. 
And part of the challenge of studying these four verses is understanding what timeline is each verse talking about. Okay, so we'll get into that. So, what are the requirements of the coming king? Dominion, care for the earth or the land. And that's why Pastor Cliff mentioned way back that land is part of God's promise to Israel. It's just not uh, the future um, uh, salvation. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, be obedient. So, what happened at the Genesis 3 is man's sin added requirements to these commands. That's, that's where here you see the four requirements, but now because man sinned, now what what does the plan have to also include? Well, the earth curse needs to be removed. Man's curse needs to be removed because if man's curse is not removed, man cannot be fully obedient to God the Father. That's why you need the son, you need the seed, right? So. Um, so as, as we look through that, the, the fulfillment, there, there's a lot going on. Um, next week, we're going to cover this, where God's plan for the coming king has to, you need a solution for the serpent's sin of deception. You need a solution for Adam's sin. You need a solution for the sin during Noah's time. Because the sin kept on coming, that's where the flood came in. You need a solution for the man's sin at the Tower of Babel. Solution for the sin during Moses' time, where they made all these idols and stuff. David's sin. So there's just a lot of things that needs to happen for this coming of the Messiah at the second coming to fulfill. And we'll see how he fulfills them all. So, and how, how it really, what really helps us is that to understand all these solutions, we look at God's covenants. All of God's covenants give us insight to His solutions. And, his, and will also give insight to His glory. We see His abundance of attributes, His plan. So next week, I want to show you how these solutions come about by studying the covenants and how that leads to how did Jesus, the one like the Son of Man, come up to the Ancient of Days to get to reach it and then to get the scroll in Revelation. All that together. But he, Jesus, had to fulfill a lot of requirements. I want to show you what how these requirements were modified as men keep on sinning. <laughs> so it's like, well, I had to the flood change some things, and then um, there's just so many things that have changed, and then eventually we'll see that um, Jesus had to come from the line of David. Right? Yes. He will be the king of the Jews in real sense. Although I'm not sure the real covenant, um, how is the solution for the um, the um, Palestine Palestine uh, covenant, Palestinian covenant? Really, is that? Yeah. Is that fulfilling the, um, the the promised land because it's not fulfilled yet? Yeah, yeah. Well, part of fulfilling would be if he had the title deed to the earth, which would include that land. Yeah. 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 The Palestinian or the land covenant, um, some people include that as a separate covenant. Um, some people say that, well, that's part of the Abrahamic covenant, which he did promise land. So um, it, it's. Uh, it's I've seen it both ways. A lot of people, although they say Palestinian covenant, they rather refer to as land covenant because it's land. They don't want to put in the word Palestine in there. So <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, that, that's it for today. Um, yeah, let me pray and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today that we can cover this material and just um, get a glimpse just a glimpse of what your plan is for for um, your word, how it covers um, your desire 
to uh, to have fellowship with um, with man, how we ought to fulfill the role, and how we can look to Jesus who did fulfill it. So, Father, we we thank you for Jesus and his. Um, not only fulfilling the role, but uh, being our advocate and being so many things to us and leaving us the Holy Spirit to reside in us, to teach us, counsel us, guard us, comfort us. Um, so, Lord, we we thank you for the whole Trinity uh, who we just want to uphold and, and just give you all the glory. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen.